There's just something about vampires, isn't there? For centuries, their wicked ways have wormed into just about every artistic pursuit. Human beings love a good vampire story, and just about every generation is ensnared by a new take on the trope. These horror staples, once objects of abject fear in traditional folklore, took on a new life in the 20th century as beings of supreme desire, ranging from carnal decadence to brooding maximalism. Seductive, melodramatic, and draped in aesthetics, the vampire should, in theory, fit beautifully in the genre of musical drama, as a figure of gothic decadence, romantic intrigue, or emotional isolation. This, however, has proven time and again not to be the case. In fact, one might call the creatures jinx, forced to forever inflict financial ruin upon all who dare to disturb the vampire's slumber with song. But just how credible is this belief? Are vampire musicals doomed to melt under the hot spotlights? Or is there something else going on here? I'm Margaret Hall, and it's time to answer the question. Are vampire musicals cursed? Meet Henfield. For the past 25 years, he's been working for a truly horrible boss. After speaking up for himself and filing an official complaint one day, he noticed that work got even worse. It's almost as if the boss had it out for him. Ha ha ha! But Henfield did some research and learned that this was called workplace retaliation. Something that's not only immoral, but also illegal. That's when Henfield decided to take action with Morgan & Morgan. As America's largest injury law firm, the attorneys with Morgan & Morgan are used to dealing with bloodsuckers. They've got the resources to fight and get the best results. Even better for Henfield, he doesn't have to pay a single thing until he wins. With just eight simple clicks, Henfield submitted his claim in no time. If the firm takes your case, then Morgan & Morgan will fight to get you the compensation you deserve. You can start your claim with Morgan & Morgan by visiting ForThePeople.com slash WaitInTheWings or by dialing pound 529. <sighs> okay, I just want to warn you, we're going to go through a lot here. But before we talk about the strange and bewildering world of bloodsuckers on Broadway, we need to understand vampires in literature. Buckle up, it's time for Bloodsuckers 101. Vampire fiction is basically built off of three foundational novels, The Vampire, Dracula, and Carmilla. All three have a key detail in common beyond their bloodsuckers. They are deeply queer-coded. Both John Polidori's The Vampire and Bram Stoker's Dracula utilize vampirism as a way to examine deadly desire, with Stoker's novel written in the aftermath of his close friend Oscar Wilde's imprisonment for indecency. The third text, credited to Irish author Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu, is Carmilla, a sapphic novel published in 1872 that follows a young woman who falls in love with a female vampire. Carmilla played an important role in vampire lore by being one of the first stories to equate the bite of a vampire to the apex of carnal pleasure. Stoker, Polidori, and Le Fanu's novels were considered positively scandalous for their time, primarily because of the vampire's seductive resistance to Christianity's moral strictures. There is no such thing as a safe vampire outside of caricature. Even prism-polished vampire stories such as Twilight possess complex sexual undertones. In the 20th century, it didn't take long for the vampire to lurk out of the shadows toward the stage. In 1927, Bela Lugosi brought Dracula to life on Broadway, becoming the pop culture touchstone for the character in the play's now legendary film adaptation. Vampire plays and vampire musicals are wholly different monsters. While a straight play requires audiences to suspend their disbelief once, mainly in order to maintain the illusion that a human actor is capable of superhuman feats, a musical requires double the suspension from the audience. Put Bela Lugosi in a cape and surround him in fog, and we can convince ourselves he's otherworldly. Give him a crooning ballad to sing, and well, you will struggle to cross the threshold of what the audience will accept with a straight face. 
A musical reimagining of Dracula was first brought to the tri-state area theatrical scene in December 1987, where it opened and closed in Teaneck, New Jersey. The show transported Stoker's classic to modern-day England, with Dracula's servant Renfield transformed into a rock and roller, his master posing as a record promoter in order to pick off victims from Renfield's horde of fans. Production was low budget and unfocused, with mime sequences, chase scenes, and one particular moment featuring athletic prancing making up the majority of the plot. Said Alvin Klein for the Times, Perhaps there are no bad ideas for musicals, just bad musicals. Like this one. The bad moniker from the Times attached to Dracula put the fear of death in producers. So much so that it took another 10 years to finally bring the genre to Broadway. Enter Tons de Vampire, a vampire musical that is a verifiable mega success internationally, running in some form or another since opening in Vienna in 1997. Featuring music by Jim, I wrote Meatloaf's best songs, Steinman, and libretto and lyrics by German heavyweight Michael Kunze, Hans de Vampire transformed Roman Polanski's 1967 spoof film, The Fearless Vampire Killers, into an extravaganza. Originally written in German, the production was developed by Polanski himself, and the show proved to have wings almost immediately, taking on a cult status overseas. Hans is a feast for the gothic eye, glittering and heavy on the aesthetics, with firmly transgressive sensuality grounding the entire piece. Telling the story of Sarah, a vital young woman from a village in the Carpathian Mountains, the vampire of the peace is the captivating Count von Krolock, who promises her eternal life and power. Simultaneously, Sarah falls in love with Alfred, the eager assistant of a bumbling professor who is in search of proof for the existence of vampires. A decade after the Dracula debacle, English producers saw the success of Tons and decided to venture back into the crypt to bring the show to English-speaking countries. After briefly considering a West End run, it was decided to bring the musical, retitled Dance of the Vampires, to New York for the 1998 season. Polanski's direction was eventually scrapped when he realized that coming back to the United States would mean facing punishment for sexually assaulting a minor in 1977. This led to the show's first major postponement. In October 2000, a tentative Fall 2001 Broadway opening was announced, along with the news that Steinman himself would serve as the show's director. Dance of the Vampires was rewritten as a musical for People who think musicals suck abandoning the rich gothic overtones in favor of at least three gags on every page of the script. Steinman also decided that a star lead in the role of Count von Krolock would be just the thing to clinch the show's Broadway success. So, he kicked out Steve Barton in favor of Michael Crawford, best known as the titular lead in Andrew Lloyd Webber's The Phantom of the Opera, Crawford insisted on performing the piece in an accent said to be a mixture of Italian and Cockney, partially out of fear that the mysteriously seductive role would seem too similar to that of the Phantom, and partially inspired by Hungarian immigrant Bela Lugosi's broken English as the original film Dracula. He underwent endless costume fittings in an attempt to hide the changes to his appearance since the 1980s, and he demanded ruffs and strange flounces be added to his costume that made him look closer to a commedia clown than a charismatic lover. As the visual identity of the show was stripped away, so too was its appeal. After a prolonged period of development, including 61 previews and two missed opening nights, Dance of the Vampires opened on Broadway on December 9th, 2002. The show was torn to shreds almost immediately. According to the New York Times, it was... One of the costliest failures in Broadway history. Losing roughly $12 million, which easily eclipsed the infamous musical Carrie's $8 million. So, what was the theater community to do following one of the largest box office losses in Broadway history? How about immediately opening a new version of Dracula, this time written by one of the most critically divisive composers of the late 20th century? 
In 2004, Frank Wildhorn, then best known for Jekyll and Hyde, sank his fangs into Stoker's classic story, to a remarkably forgettable effect. Ben Brantley summed up the general feelings on the production succinctly, saying, And here it is, looming like a giant stuffed bat on a stick, the easiest target on Broadway. Dracula lost $7.5 million before shutting down within five months of its August 2004 Broadway opening, doomed to almost immediately become a footnote in the careers of all involved. Perhaps betting on the rule of three, the early 2000s saw one more attempt to bring vampires to the Broadway stage. At the same time, the world saw one of the largest vampire interest spikes in pop culture history. Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles series had redefined the genre in the late 20th century, reframing vampires as complex beings trapped in a sort of eternal purgatory, closer to human than any other vampire story had ventured before. Centered on the exploits of the extravagantly extra Lestat de Leoncourt, the first two books of the Vampire Chronicles were written in a quasi-memoir style, crafting a narrative that you were truly seeing into the memories and private thoughts of eternal beings. Imagine walking into a bookstore in the late 1970s where you find what seems to be an actual interview with a vampire. Intriguing, no? Dracula may have collapsed in on itself like a black hole, but Lestat opened on Broadway at the apex of the general public's hunger for vampire stories premiering the very same year that Twilight was published, kicking off a pop culture craze that is yet to be equaled. Regrettably, the same couldn't be said for the musical Lestat. Following up his hit score for Disney theatricals Aida, Sir Elton John took on the monumental task of adapting Anne Rice's iconic work with aplomb. Featuring some of John's most compelling ballad melodies, and the reunion of John with his beloved pop songwriting partner Bernie Taupin, Lestat was the highest earning pre-Broadway production in San Francisco history, beating out the mega hit Wicked. The San Francisco version had elaborate stage effects and production values, and included projected images illustrating the titular character's story as he wrote his memoirs, providing clarity to the dramatic narrative. This striking aesthetic effect, combined with the show's earnestly queer sensibility, had watchful New Yorkers hopeful. The show's producers, however, weren't as confident in its future, and insisted on several major changes when it transferred from San Francisco to New York. The majority of these adjustments were made without John's involvement or approval, as he had already moved on from the active writing stage of the project, considering Lestat to be complete and ready for release. Instead, the show was carved into ribbons, removing much of the show's queerness in favor of a mostly implied approach, forcibly reorienting the musical to resemble the 1994 film adaptation Interview with the Vampire. Fans of the book series were appalled by these heteronormative changes, which they considered sacrilege to Rice's original text. By altering the core relationships of the story, the heart of the show collapsed, and what was left was a weak shadow that isolated the show's original audience. The musical began previews on Broadway at the Palace Theatre on March 25, 2006, and closed on May 28, 2006, after 33 previews and 39 performances. It is beyond lamentable that the queer core of Lestat was excised. Had its producers been paying attention, they would have known that they had the potential to make good on the promise of an earlier avant-garde vampire musical that had found its footing with a distinctly queer heart. Debuting off-Broadway at La Mama in 1970, Carmilla, A Vampire's Tale, straddled the line between being a musical and a multimedia opera. The story of Carmilla is somewhat straightforward. Laura, the castle-dwelling daughter of a wealthy widower who lives in near solitude, dreams of a mysterious, dark-haired woman who comes to her bedchamber under the cover of night. More than a decade later, a woman who once shared the same dream, Carmilla, is taken in by Laura's father after a carriage accident. Carmilla and Laura soon become inseparable, their moods becoming intertwined as young women in the nearby village die in increasing succession. At the same time, 
Laura finds herself consumed by unspeakable pleasures under the cover of night, frightening her father as she grows weak. The story culminates in the slaying of Carmilla by a team of local men, restoring patriarchal order to Laura's household, although she never forgets what she and Carmilla shared. The bloody, beating heart of Carmilla is their relationship, and the musical adaptation was anything but veiled in its depiction of lesbian sexuality. La Mama founder Ellen Stewart regarded the chamber musical to be one of her greatest hits, and the show was revived several times to great interest throughout the off-Broadway ecosystem. Carmilla took bold aesthetic choices a step further, with supporting characters popping out as wooden faces from within the couch the leads were sitting on, rendering them little more than set dressing in the face of Carmilla and Laura's intoxicating relationship. If there is one thing that American executives have long feared, it is art that flies in the face of conservative morality. It is no mistake that one of the traditional vampire weaknesses is the presence of Christianity in the form of crosses and holy water. When a production, such as Carmilla or Tons, accepts the sensual reality as a core truth, rather than attempting to reshape it into something more palatable, they find success. When a musical abandons those foundational values in favor of something easier to package and sell to a general public, the vampire is likely to disintegrate into a cloud of dust. So, are vampire musicals really cursed when it comes to Broadway? Or is it just that the attempt to sanitize, censor, and commodify the subgenre stabs a stake into everything that makes a vampire story a vampire story? Vampire musicals can work. We saw it with Carmilla, we continue to see it with Tons, and I have faith that one day they will rise again. If a vampire musical is to overcome the curse, they must be returned to their roots. Deeply personal stories centered on taboo topics that have to be expressed through words and wit. If you take away a vampire's charms, you strip them of their intrigue, and all you're left with is an oversized and overdressed pest. But vampires aren't the only monsters who've had a tough go on Broadway. Click on this video to learn all about what happened when King Kong starred in his own musical as a 20-foot puppet. <laughs>